Hello everyone, this is Styles. I hope you've all been doing well. If I'm being honest, I've been struggling a bit with some of my other projects, so I decided to take a step back and work on something else I've had on the back burner. My Final Fantasy IV video is far and away my most popular one, and it's also one of the videos I'm most proud of. But I've always hated how bad the PSP footage looked because of the tech I had at the time. I recorded it with the PSP component cables and, well, <laughs> it doesn't look great. So I took the opportunity to remaster the video with newly recorded footage to bring it up to my modern standards. The video is largely the same as it once was. I'm still using the same audio and a lot of the same footage outside of the PSP sections. But our good friend Byte, the channel mascot, decided to add some commentary of his own so that longtime viewers had something new to look forward to. It seems like he's sick of just being a cute face around here. I hope you all enjoy this entry of Style Series Synopsis Remastered. For those of you who think I'm too critical or that I don't enjoy anything, you're in for a surprise today. I'm going to spend the majority of this video fawning over what a masterpiece Final Fantasy IV is and why that is the case. So take this moment to prepare yourself for some well-reasoned fanboyism. Immediately after completing work on Final Fantasy III, Square began working on two new Final Fantasy titles, one for the original Famicom and one for the newly released Super Famicom. Time has shown that the Famicom, or NES version outside of Japan, was not meant to be. There are conflicting reports on how complete the NES version of Final Fantasy IV was before it was scrapped. Initially, Sakaguchi stated that they were merely in the planning phases, but there's a rumor circulating that he lied to the press out of shame and that the title had actually reached 80% completion before being cancelled. This rumor remains unfounded. It was supposedly stated by Sakaguchi himself in an interview for Dengeki Super Famicom Magazine, but the exact issue number has never been cited. In addition to that, if we take a step back and view things logically, it just doesn't make much sense. Final Fantasy III was released in 1990 in Japan, and Final Fantasy IV released only one year later in 1991. Given Square's relatively small company size at the time and the jump to new hardware, I highly doubt they had the manpower to build two entirely different RPGs in the same series simultaneously. Add in the fact that they weren't even willing to translate the existing NES titles for fear of them being outdated outside of Japan, and there would be no logical reason for them to continue NES development at all. So with that in mind, there's no need to lament the long-lost NES version of Final Fantasy IV. That's not the only interesting tidbit I dug up while researching Final Fantasy IV's development. Apparently, at one point during development, the creators thought about shifting the gameplay style by having a consistent overworld without battle transitions and more action-based combat. These ideas were ultimately abandoned as they were deemed to be too much of a departure from the series' original vision. Times have certainly changed, haven't they? These concepts and ideas were not thrown out entirely, however, as they would later be used to develop the questionably popular Secret of Mana. This finally brings us to the version of Final Fantasy IV that made it to market. During development, it was decided that the end goal of Final Fantasy IV was to take all the successful elements of the first three games and put them together to make the ultimate Final Fantasy title. A concoction of the first game's exploration, the second's focus on storytelling, and the third's strategic combat, all wrapped up in the power of the Super Nintendo. And to say that they succeeded would be an understatement. Well, with some caveats. While the original Japanese version of Final Fantasy IV for the Super Famicom was undoubtedly the most impressive game in the series when it was initially released, time has been less than kind to it. And if you're an American player who played the game when it was originally released as Final Fantasy II in the States, well, then you weren't getting the true experience at all. Final Fantasy IV, much like Final Fantasies 1 and 2, has been ported and remade multiple times since its initial Super Famicom launch, and most of those releases are plagued with issues that kept the game's true brilliance from shining through. Whether accidental bugs or intentional design decisions, it took Square years to finally create a definitive version of this title. And the easiest way to discuss why is to take a glimpse at each version. So let's get started, shall we? First, we of course have the Super Famicom version, which was never released outside of Japan. From what little I can gather, it's... Fine. It looks dated by today's standards, but the story is complete and the gameplay remains relatively similar to the latest re-release. Unfortunately, this is not the version that the rest of the world would get their hands on. Final Fantasy IV was butchered during localization. Text limitations that came with the switch from Japanese to English meant that one quarter of the script had to be cut. Yes, one quarter, not the often cited three quarter that came from a mistranslation. More appalling than that, however, were the numerous gameplay changes that were made to make the game more digestible to RPG newcomers. All the character-specific abilities were cut out and 
entirely. Things like Cecil's darkness or Tella's recall ability. A lot of items removed as well, including some equipment and both offensive and defensive consumable items. At the time, I suppose it was better than having nothing, but since the game has had so many re-releases or hell, even a fan transitions available for the Super Famicom version if you want the most original experience, there's absolutely no reason to play this truncated version any longer. And what is easily the most interesting of Final Fantasy IV's re-releases, the American release was used as a model for a new version in Japan, known as Final Fantasy IV Easy Type. There's often confusion surrounding this. The Easy Type is not identical to the version of the game that America got, despite what a lot of rumors have said. It is just based off the same gameplay changes. The game retains the original Japanese script and also includes a brand new final boss that is ironically considered to be even more difficult than the original versions. This release in particular just perplexes me, and I have no idea why it exists. Sometimes the truth is stranger than fiction, you know? While players outside of Japan were initially swindled out of a complete version of Final Fantasy IV, they would finally gain access to a proper version of the game when it was re-released on the original PlayStation, bundled with Chrono Trigger and Final Fantasy Chronicles. While it was nice to finally have a version of the game that restored the original difficulty and didn't have aspects of the story censored or flat out cut, it suffered from poor emulation and long load times that still make it difficult to recommend. Not to mention that even at the time of its release, it was late for the PlayStation, and the presentation wasn't going to wow anyone. Unless, of course, this glorious CGI opening does it for you. The game received its first official remake for the Wonderswan Color, a handheld system I talked about a bit more in my Final Fantasy 3 video for those curious. This version was never released in English, and there isn't much to note about it beyond the fact that the Wonderswan forced the devs to create an 8-bit version of the classic Final Fantasy 4 soundtrack, which is simultaneously fascinating and ear grating to listen to. Seriously, look it up on YouTube, it's just... It's something else. This version was eventually ported to the Game Boy Advance worldwide, where it had its own slew of issues. While the GBA port was easily the best looking version at the time, the Game Boy Advance sound chip had a negative impact on the audio that many Final Fantasy purists like to complain about. This is an often cited complaint of all the Final Fantasy Advance ports for that matter. If that wasn't enough, the game suffered from some disastrous bugs, especially pertaining to the combat. For example, one of the game's backup party members stops getting HP bonuses once he reaches level 50, which admittedly is only really an issue for players interested in the bonus content, but it's an issue nonetheless. What was a constant problem, however, was the menu coding, which often caused input delays in combat that could cause players to choose the wrong commands. Less common but just as annoying was an ATB bug that would skip or give two turns to characters as they fought. Luckily, most of these issues were mitigated in the European release of the game, so if you're interested in the Game Boy Advance port, that's the cart you should go with, especially because the Game Boy Advance is region free. My first time beating Final Fantasy IV was actually the American Game Boy Advance port, and I can admit that if the bugs were fixed, it would have been a decent version, though still not the best available. Which finally brings us to the PSP and 3D versions of the game, which are the two I will actually be critiquing in this video. Now that the history lesson has concluded, let's jump into the actual analysis. Final Fantasy IV begins with the Dark Knight Cecil returning from a dastardly mission that had him slaughtering innocent people. Filled with remorse from his deeds and fearful of his king's continuation of this cruelty towards other kingdoms, Cecil decides that the king must be stopped and Baron must be returned to its former glory. This change in Cecil's character is manifested physically when Cecil transforms from a Dark Knight to a Paladin. From that point on, the game follows Cecil and friends as they attempt to stop Baron and eventually save the world. I made this summary vague on purpose, but even this short summary makes it incredibly clear that Final Fantasy IV has stepped up its storytelling focusing more on deep characters and their motivation than the previous games did. This is something that almost all the later entries would continue to focus on. Without going into too much detail, I could say that I greatly enjoyed the more serious tone and attention to storytelling, and was happy to see the series move in this direction. What impressed me more than the story itself, however, and what I'm mostly going to focus on in the story critique, is how that story was told. First off, it's important to note that despite the game's subject matter, the story has as many cheerful and comedic moments as it does dramatic ones, which went a long way to keeping me invested. Too often games with serious narratives focus on being all sad all the time, completely missing out on the advantage provided by emotional contrast. This is a topic I plan on giving a lot more attention to in my Final Fantasy IX review, but the mentality got its start here. As previously mentioned, the plot is focused almost entirely on Cecil and his redemption arc, which has led some people to say that the rest of the characters aren't well developed enough to be interesting, which is a sentiment I disagree with for a few reasons, but the most important reason is, well, 
let's have a literary lesson and discuss the difference between flat and round characters and their place in a narrative. Round characters are the characters that the plot focuses on. They grow and change throughout the course of the story and are multifaceted, carrying a lot of depth and nuance. Flat characters, on the other hand, often remain static in terms of personal growth and are defined by a few simple and easily identifiable personality traits and are normally only present to support the round characters in the story as a whole. A good story needs to make use of both of these. It's an important balance to strike. If all of your characters are round, then your story will become bogged down and bloated. For example, it doesn't matter that we know nothing about the Elder beyond his job, because he's meant to support Cecil's story, not tell his own. The same can be said for a few of the party members. Rosa is the most extreme example of this, as she's used more as a plot device than a character, acting as a damsel in distress at multiple points and being a key component in Kane's own character arc. Speaking of which, Kane is one of the best examples of a round character in the narrative, and I'm choosing to use him as an example instead of Cecil because it's expected for the main character to be round, but that's not often the case for other party members. Minor spoilers start now by the way, so if you're worried about that you can skip to this point in the video. Kane is an anti-hero, and likely the series most interesting one at that. He's the leader of the Dragoons and Cecil's lifelong friend. When Cecil questions the King's orders at the beginning of the game, Kane immediately jumps to Cecil's defense and is banished along with him. This immediately shows his loyalty and valor, which makes it all the more puzzling when Kane eventually betrays Cecil later on. You see, as much as Kane cares about Cecil, he bears a latent resentment towards him because he is envious of Cecil's prestige, and more importantly, he's jealous that Cecil's the recipient of Rose's love. This makes Kane easy prey for the primary antagonist Golbez, or more accurately Zeromas, to manipulate him, forcing him to seek out the crystals and do their bidding. Kane's arc is an internal struggle between his loyalty to his friend and a romance that can never Blossom. It's a tale as old as time, but handled surprisingly well given the medium. All of this detail shows that Kane is his own character and therefore his own purposes, not just as a foil for Cecil, and the story feels more complete because of this. Kane, Cecil, and Rydia act as this story's round characters, while the remainder act as the flatter supporting characters. What's amazing about this is that even the flattest of the game's characters feel real in comparison to most other JRPGs in the market. You learn enough about them to gain an understanding of who they truly are, what drives them, and what they do when they are not out adventuring. They may be simple answers. For example, what do Palum and Porum do? Well, they study to become better mages. Then there's Sid, who, spoiler for the whole series, uh, works on airships in his free time. A lot of games don't even think to put that much detail into the world building, however. Sure, we see sweeping dramatic events in most JRPGs, but the moment the characters move off screen, they cease to exist. That is not the case here. Oh, and while we're on the subject of the characters and their stories, I really had nowhere else to put this, but can I just take this moment to say how cool it is to see a pre-started relationship in a JRPG? Cecil and Rosa may not have the most riveting chemistry in this series, but it's refreshing to see a romantic partnership in a game that isn't about the conquest, and instead about the trials of already being with somebody. This theme wasn't explored deeply, I'm not trying to pretend as if it was well done, but I'm honestly happy to have seen it put in the game at all. I'd also like to compliment the game's use of subtext, which is far better than it has any right to be. It's amazing how much of the character development is shown through action rather than dialogue. So much is said through character movement, hesitation, and silence here that wouldn't have been nearly as impactful if they relied on a dramatic monologue or... Yeah, that. The 3D version isn't always an improvement when it comes to the storytelling, and that's something I'll cover more when discussing the presentation, but while I'm briefly touching on the 3D version story differences, I suppose I should state that the 3D version of the game has exactly two added scenes that help to flesh out the backstories of a couple of the main characters. The implementation of said scenes leaves me conflicted, however. I am happy to get the extra bit of information, it does help to flesh things out, but they detract from the game's sublime pacing because when the scenes play, they have very little to do with the matter at hand. I can admit that this is a minor complaint at best, and some players will want that extra bit of story regardless of how forced in the scenes are. I just wanted to state it here because I've seen fans of the 3D version insist that these scenes are crucial to the game's plot and that they make the 3D version superior on that premise alone, which is a gross exaggeration of these scenes' importance. The final story addition that's unique to the 3D version is a series of thought bubbles that you can check by accessing your in-game menu. Depending on what character you have representing your party, you can see what their thoughts are on the situation at hand. This, once again, is a double-edged sword. It's a fun little addition, but nothing truly important is added, and in fact, a couple of the thoughts spoil plot points that have yet to occur in the game at the time the thoughts are presented, which feels infuriatingly misguided. This is just one example of a repeated pattern with a 3D remake, illustrating how more is not always better. When taking a look at the overall narrative for both versions, there are only three real complaints that I found to be often lobbed at Final Fantasy IV's story. The first is that the story is cliché. Eh, 
I suppose that's something I can't argue against with cold hard facts. You likely have seen this story done before. I could try to defend this by saying that this was one of the first highly character driven games on consoles and it wasn't considered cliche when it was first released. I could also argue that there are only seven or so plots in existence as the pedantic so often do. Or I could simply state that the fast pace and great execution more than made up for the admittedly formulaic plot structure. The second complaint is that the hokier moments are just too over the top and that they shatter people's suspension of disbelief. And if this is where you stand, I am sympathetic to that mindset. I have the same issue with a lot of the later Final Fantasy titles. This game does have a number of plot conveniences, and there were even a few that had me rolling my eyes, but often they are either played for comedy or glossed over so quickly that I was able to get over them. The worst of these contrivances is one that even I have a hard time swallowing, however. Final Fantasy IV relies on the formulaic self-sacrifice of its characters to remove them from your party, and yet all but one of these sacrifices ends up being completely false, cheapening the experience. If this aspect is enough to keep you from getting invested, I completely understand. Look, I'm not going to pretend that this is grand or operatic storytelling. It's not going to shake you to your core, but in the realms of what is normally expected from the JRPG genre in terms of storytelling, which, let's admit it, history has proven this bar is incredibly low, Final Fantasy IV still manages to stand out 25 years later, if not with its concepts, then with its execution. At some point, there's no accounting for personal taste. I can praise the concise writing, use of subtext, and strong characterization all day long, but if the fake-out deaths in Lunarian subplot are too much for some players to handle, then I can't really fault them for that. I will fault them if they don't enjoy the soundtrack, however. Though it will be a shock to absolutely no one, I must report that Final Fantasy IV's soundtrack is brilliant. It was a true evolution for Uematsu, not just because of the freedom that the Super Nintendo offered him compared to the NES, but because the direction of the new title granted him a different perspective. Final Fantasy IV was the first time that a Final Fantasy game made use of character themes, that is, songs meant to represent party members and by extension their personality or story arcs. These would become some of his most popular compositions in later works, and they are well executed even in this first attempt. Palamon Porum's theme in particular sticks out to me as it complements the whimsical attitude of the young twins. These are my favorite characters from Final Fantasy IV, by the way. What is amazing is that Final Fantasy IV's music has long since been recognized as outstanding not just by gamers, but by the music world as a whole. In fact, Final Fantasy IV's track, Theme of Love, is so well recognized that it's often taught to school children in Japan as part of their standard music curriculum. While not necessarily a big deal to hear of something like this occurring nowadays, when I was a teenager and first learned this bit of trivia, it blew my mind that video game music was finally getting some well-deserved recognition. Anyway, back to the music in the games themselves. By default, both versions use the same orchestral arrangement of the soundtracks, which means you are in for audio bliss either way. I say by default, because the PSP version of the game does offer players the opportunity to switch to the Super Nintendo rendition of the soundtrack, which is a great bonus for nostalgic fans or just those who are curious about how the music has evolved over time. While the music may be identical, the visual design of the two titles couldn't be more different. Following in the footsteps of the last two Final Fantasy remakes on PSP, Final Fantasy IV is visually sharp, colorful, and enticing. I've discussed this particular art style twice already in my Final Fantasy and Final Fantasy II reviews, so I'm not sure what to add to it now, except to say that Final Fantasy IV's color palette seems to hit a happy middle ground between the vibrant and inviting style of the first and the muted and grim style of the second game, which fits perfectly with Final Fantasy IV's overall tone. I don't think anyone can reasonably argue against this being the most beautiful 2D version to date, and I honestly feel that anyone who does attempt to argue that point of view is far too steeped in nostalgia to be rational. Though, I do still find it hilarious how Cecil magically gets a haircut when he enters battle. See? Short hair, long hair. Short hair, long hair. Is it too much for me to ask for a little bit of visual consistency? This is what it looks like when I have to grasp for complaints, people. While the PSP version of the game remains consistently high quality in terms of presentation, the 3D version is more of a mixed bag. For those that don't know, the 3D version of the game was originally created for the DS by the same team that made the Final Fantasy III remake, Matrix Software. Also like Final Fantasy III, the DS version has since been ported to smartphones and PC, the latter of which is the version I played. While I stood up for Final Fantasy III Steam release when it came to the visuals, the unfortunate truth is that Final Fantasy IV's 3D version was just not meant to be upscaled to these resolutions. To compensate for the small enemy count issue that plagued Final Fantasy III's battles, Matrix Software crafted all of the combat models in FF4 with fewer polygons, and it is easily apparent. If we take a look at Final Fantasy III and Final Fantasy IV side by side, the pixelization is far more obvious than the latter title. 
It seems that in this 3D transition, the frame rate also suffered, which leaves the game feeling choppy and at times ugly during battle. I do appreciate the more realistic character proportions in Final Fantasy IV, but the style and tone of Final Fantasy III lent itself to the more chibi design, while Final Fantasy IV's relatively darker story and themes don't quite mesh as well with this art style. There is still a charm present with these character models that few other games have been able to replicate for me, and I have to admit that I have a bit of a soft spot for it, but I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't bring it up. I am, however, happy to note that Final Fantasy IV's area layouts feel far less artificial in 3D than its predecessors did, with the boxy and bare rooms being replaced with more organic feeling locations. This coupled with the successful use of character to area size proportions makes the world feel, at the very least, visually consistent and believable. It would be unfair of me not to point out that part of this stems from the source material itself, as the Super Nintendo was more powerful than the NES and allowed for more creative designs already, but I had to give credit to Matrix Software for using what they learned from the previous title and approving on it as much as they could given the DS's limitations. Though I'm sure I've made this obvious already, I much prefer the 2D version's presentation overall. But I can't deny the benefits that come with the Switch to 3D, especially when it comes to the cutscenes. The cinematic camera angles coupled with the far more expressive and fully malleable 3D character models made these scenes far more visually interesting. The 3D version also has voice acting during the majority of the cutscenes, though the vocal performances vary wildly from serviceable to unintentionally hilarious. You think our rage a weakness? Then let me show you how wrong you are! Anna, there's life left in you yet. So, you are Cecil. Allow me to give you something. A gift to remember our meeting. I wouldn't be surprised if people preferred the 3D version for this aspect alone, as it leaves far less to the imagination and gives a more dramatic flair to the events occurring. And even I'll say that when I could take the voice acting seriously, which was about 80% of the time, I found myself slightly more immersed in the story here than I was in the 2D version. This leads into a moment of personal reflection I'd like to share, which occurred while playing these two versions of the same game back to back. Seeing the same bouts of dialogue play out from a static top-down view versus a dynamic and fully voiced recreation gave me a small moment of insight. It's amazing to see how proper use of technological advancements and presentation can help bolster up a story if used properly. I know this is an obvious statement on the surface, but I can think of no better way to see it in action than by playing these two titles back to back. This is especially important to note since arguments continue to rage about how the focus on better graphics in the industry have made overall storytelling and game design lazier. I've even caught myself making flippant statements such as, presentation doesn't matter, only gameplay does, which is a fundamentally untrue statement. I do still wholeheartedly believe that a game must rely on more than polished presentation to be great, whether the game is story-centric or mechanically driven, but to say that presentation does not matter is completely false. This is not a new revelation for me but to have it reinforced visually with a side-by-side -side comparison was a validating experience. That having been said, these two versions of the game prove my point perfectly. Presentation does matter, but the 3D version's cinematic improvements do not make it the superior version of the game, as I will attempt to further explain while discussing the gameplay. In case the footage hadn't already made it obvious, Final Fantasy IV is fairly true to its roots in terms of gameplay. You still travel in an overworld and through dungeons, with random turn-based battles interrupting your progression, but the biggest change to this game's combat is the newly implemented ATB system. ATB, also known as Active Time Battle, is a series staple. Instead of combat being entirely turn-based, time is ever flowing, with the character's speed stat determining how quickly a meter fills and grants them another action. This also means that time does not stop when you are selecting items or spells, so the player has to think quickly. Most Final Final Fantasy games give you the option to make the meters pause when you're going through the larger menus, which is something I always take advantage of. It's always been my thinking that the caster knows exactly what spell they're going to cast, so the time digging through the menu would not be there in real life. But hey, the fact that the game gives you the option to turn it off means that I have no reason to complain. Another aspect that makes this system more interesting is that often a charge time is implemented so actions like casting spells won't occur immediately after being selected. This goes a long way towards making the gameplay more strategic and dynamic. Sure, my white mage is the better here. Either. Will she be able to cast a spell before the enemy can make a finishing blow? Or should I bandage up my character with an item first to make sure they survive until their spell can go off? It's a system that has since been so commonly used that we often take it for granted, but it goes a long way to making the combat more dynamic and strategic, especially with a five-person party like you have in Final Fantasy IV, meaning that interaction is almost constant. A common complaint I see about Final Fantasy IV is that the game doesn't offer any customization when it comes to the main party, which is true. All of your characters have predetermined roles and automatically gain stats and 
abilities when they level up. Even equipment progression is linear, with each new item being the obviously better equipment option. Many argue that this lack of customization is a weakness, but I argue that it's actually a strength. Final Fantasy IV is the perfect example of using linearity to a game's advantage. Yeah, yeah, I know Final Fantasy X and XIII are bashed for their linearity. How can it be a strength here? Well, I had to think on it for a long time, but I think I finally stumbled upon the answer. The problem with Final Fantasy X and XIII when compared to the other games in the series is not a lack of exploration, but a lack of discovery. Let me attempt to explain this more deeply. Final Fantasy X and Final Fantasy XIII's maps are structured basically as straight lines. Forward momentum is constant, which is arguably a good thing for keeping pacing consistent, but there is never a moment where the player really has control over where they are going, which cuts down on the feeling of discovery a player is likely to experience when compared to the more open games in the series. Discovery, in these titles, becomes almost entirely dependent on visuals and exposition, which is not something I say dismissively. Some of the most impactful moments in any game come from entering a new location and seeing how beautiful, fast, or creepy it is for the first time, or from having a large plot twist revealed to the player. And Final Fantasy X and Final Fantasy XIII both make amazing use of this, as do earlier games like Final Fantasy VII. Now, a lot of this is also true of Final Fantasy IV. The next destination is almost always clear, and while you can visit locations out of order thanks to the overworld system and the airship access, you can still only make the story progress in a linear fashion, and it tries to throw its own expositional curveballs at the player as well. On the other hand, Final Fantasy IV's intentionally dated artistic design makes visual discovery a lot harder to pull off, and thus it isn't a tool that's heavily relied upon. You still get a bit of it with the last leg of the game, but it mostly relies on another tool to get the job done, one it uses in addition to the ones that Final Fantasy X and XIII provide. That tool is dungeons. Every dungeon acts as its own hub of exploration and discovery. From the the second you step inside, every treasure you find, every battle you face, and every dead end you happen upon is a revelatory moment. The feeling may be less concentrated than, say, the first time you enter Cosmo Canyon, but the fact that the discovery is more constant and player-driven provides a sense of agency and completeness that the visual tactic alone just cannot properly provide. To give a rather crude visual example, Final Fantasy X and XIII's structure looks like this, while the structure of most earlier Final Fantasy games looks like this, with each block representing a dungeon that adds a level of player interactivity that is simply missing from the aforementioned entries. With all that in mind, I pose this theoretical question to you. What's more exciting, seeing a beautiful but well-documented portrait on display in a museum, or finding a slightly less stunning but still well-composed painting sitting in an attic somewhere, forgotten by the rest of the world? It is at least my experience that people get more excitement from finding something themselves than by having it simply shown to them, because then it becomes personal. And while everything in the game has to be painstakingly programmed, and technically everything implemented was meant to at some point be discovered, good game design leads the players of thinking that they made the discovery for themselves, instead of making it feel like a guided tour. To give one last example, I didn't discover Beacon Isle Desert. Sin dropped me here. But I sure as hell found the Lair of the Father, all on my own, and that is a feeling of accomplishment that cannot easily be replicated or replaced. Now that I'm done explaining how the linearity differs from later games in the series, let's get back on track and discuss how the linearity bolsters up not just the game's storytelling and pacing, but the combat as well. At multiple points throughout the game, Final Fantasy IV will throw the player to a curveball by replacing members of their party. The frequently shifting cast of characters means the player will constantly have to experiment with a new party and develop new team tactics. So even though there is no customization, your party dynamic shifts enough to always keep you on your toes. The linear progression also means that the developers knew what characters the player would have and when which was used to make the game's combat remarkably well-balanced and strategic at all times. When the game gives you mages that can exploit a boss's weakness, it is a dev's way of throwing the player a bone. When the game limits you to only melee characters, it's because the developers want you to think outside the box and make strategic decisions about which one will make for the best support character. All of this attention to detail comes with the added benefit of cutting out necessary grinding completely. It turns the game from a customizable onslaught into a series of well-planned challenges, and while RPGs don't normally take this approach, I absolutely absolutely adore it here. Gaming through gameplay, brilliant pacing, decent storytelling, and excellent difficulty balancing are all things that Final Fantasy IV succeeds at so well that many players don't realize how intricate it all is. And to prove my point, I'd like to dissect just one quest line to show the expertise with which this game was crafted. Cecil's journey to become a paladin. None of this will be a spoiler, by the way, as this whole quest takes place about one to three hours into the game, depending on the speed at which you play. 
This quest begins at our hero's lowest point. He has just failed to stop the theft of a crystal. His love interest, Rosa, has been kidnapped. He's been betrayed by his best friend, Kane. A little on the nose there, Final Fantasy IV. And Leviathan attacked the ship he was traveling on, which caused him to become separated from his friends and stranded in the middle of nowhere. From a gameplay perspective, the player is put in a location where they can only travel in one direction because water blocks all other sides, which guides Cecil to the town of Mysidia. This location has a particular relevance to Cecil as it acts as the location of his inciting instant. It was his slaying of innocence in this very town that caused him to doubt his king's orders and set his character arc in motion. It's no surprise that the denizens of Mysidia aren't too fond of having Cecil around. In fact, talking to some of them will result in them attacking you outright with magic, turning you into a frog or pig. Still, even so, with no other option, Cecil presses forward to talk to the village's elder. This is another great moment. Cecil apologizes and the elder basically says, it doesn't matter if you're sorry. Nothing you do will bring back the dead. You can't change the past, you can only do better in the future. This leads to the conclusion that if Cecil is truly willing to change and wants to stop Golbez from destroying the world, he'll have to go to Mount Ordeals to become a paladin. At this point, the elder commands for a set of mage twins, Palam and Por him, to accompany him on his quest, both for their magic ability but also to spy on Cecil, though the latter is not yet known to the player. For gameplay reasons, Mysidia's armor shop holds a set of armor that Cecil cannot equip as a Dark Knight but will need to use as a paladin. While this is not blatantly stated, the intention is made clear by the fact that the only other party members you have access to are mages that can't use that type of armor at all, and Cecil is on a quest to become a different type of knight, so it's pretty easy to connect the dots. Now, the armor for paladins is incredibly expensive, and given the fact that you likely didn't know you were going to lose your entire party or need to change classes, you probably spent all of your money at the previous town, outfitting Cecil with a new set of Dark Knight armor which will become pointless in a number of minutes, and purchasing items because the game tells you that you will be assaulting Baron before your ship gets attacked. This will likely leave Cecil broke, adding to the helplessness of the situation. The developers were kind enough to give the player two equally feasible options at this point. If you're the type of player that likes to avoid grinding, you may move forward without farming for enough gil to purchase the armor prior to mount or deals. You'll likely make all the money you'll need from said dungeon by the time you return to Mysidia. This comes at the expense of making the return trip more difficult for the player, as Cecil's defense will be terrible. Alternatively, you can fight the powerful zoo enemies that appear around Mysidia, as they drop a considerable amount of gil per battle. Normally, this would be a difficult and time-consuming task, but the developers thoughtfully gave you the Deathbringer Sword mere minutes before, a weapon that has a percentage chance of afflicting the enemy with instant death, which is a status ailment that the zoos are vulnerable to, making the fight far faster and easier to deal with than they otherwise would have been. This allows for easy access to both the Paladin's first set of armor, as well as any upgrades you may need for the twin mages that will accompany Cecil on his journey. Now that preparations are complete, we'll talk about the journey itself. Mount Ordeals is filled almost entirely with undead creatures, making Cecil all but useless to fight them with the Dark Knight abilities, but the game gives you two mages, a white and black mage, to fight them off. Normally this would feel like a handicap, only having one offensive character in the party, but because these enemies are undead, even your healer can be made useful for offense, as casting healing magic on undead enemies does damage to them. This shifts the entire party dynamic, turning Cecil, who can barely harm the undead, into a healer through item use if need be, while the twins dish out damage. This has the added benefit of bolstering the story, not just with the simple and stated point of you can't fight darkness with darkness, but by encouraging Cecil to be useful in a defensive and supportive manner. Of course, you can just continue to brute force your way through like you would in previous battles leading to this point, but it's incredibly inefficient. At the top of the mountain, you are met with the first of the four elemental archfiends in the form of Skarmiglion. You end up fighting two versions of this boss, one after the other. The first acts as a test of using your spellcasters effectively to defeat the undead, while Cecil can work to defeat the boss himself or continue playing defensively, as Palin's fire spell is devastating to this enemy. The second encounter with Skarmiglion, while technically now undead himself, is not resistant to Cecil's Dark Blade, which gives the players one last boss fight in which to make use of Cecil's abilities, giving the player a chance to say goodbye to Dark Knight Cecil in style. This culminates in a scripted battle between the newly transformed Cecil and his dark side, where the game flat out tells you that a real paladin knows when to sheathe his blade as opposed to attacking incessantly. It's one last way to hammer the themes home in case you'd missed them leading up to this point. And while this is the end of the quest, so to speak, it's still not the end of the game's brilliant design when it comes to Cecil's transformation. After Cecil becomes a paladin, he is reset to level 1 for story purposes, but his stats are higher than what they would be for other characters at level 1, making him weak, but not entirely useless. Furthermore, his sword is wholly elemental, making him effective against the undead of the mountains, so within just a few battles, which you will likely run into naturally as you head towards the exit, Cecil's strength will become roughly comparable to what it was before said transformation. While this long-winded example is likely the most well-planned part of the game, the vast majority of the title is constructed with nearly that same attention to detail. Having trouble fighting the trapdoor enemies? Just keep your 
a white mage on standby, and as soon as a party member is targeted, cast Reflect on that character. It will bounce the instant death spell back against the enemy, making easy work of them. Remember the part of the game where Cecil and Rydia are attacked by Baron guards? Well, if you kill all three of the soldiers, then the captain will just run away. But if you kill the captain first, then the three remaining soldiers will become confused and begin to attack one another. How about the magnetic cave, which paralyzes anyone who's using metal weapons and armor? Luckily, the game gives you characters who don't need to rely on metal. And while Cecil is the most penalized by this dungeon, it teaches the player not to rely on one character too strongly. Plus, he still has use of his white magic to once again act as support. Speaking of dungeon gimmicks, Final Fantasy IV does a remarkable job of keeping its dungeons interesting and well designed. There are a few caves and passages that are fairly straightforward, but they also remain short, which keeps focus on forward momentum, while the longer dungeons almost always have something unique about them, from floors that cause your party damage to hidden rooms and secret passages. All of these minuscule design choices make this world feel real, and the fact that I could say that about a game that has your party members walking on the surface of the moon without helmets says a lot. If I wanted to nitpick, which Let's face it, after all the praise I've been slinging around I feel compelled to, there are only a couple of small problems I can think to mention. For one, the game starts off way too easy for my liking and doesn't really pick up until the midway point. Arguably this could still be seen as a good thing because it eases the player in and ramps up considerably towards the end, but I would have liked to have been challenged a bit more overall. And uh, actually that's pretty much my only nitpick when it comes to the game design. In fact, that's what it boils down to. Pretty much all of my complaints about this version of the game become nitpicks. I wish I could say the same about the 3D version. <laughs> The most obvious change to the 3D version of Final Fantasy IV in terms of gameplay is the difficulty. Or at least, it is if you play on the difficulty the game was designed around. When Final Fantasy IV was originally reimagined for the DS, the game had only one difficulty, and it's equivalent to the Steam's hard mode. Longtime viewers will not be surprised to hear that I enjoyed the challenges provided. It made the more difficult boss fights in the game the absolute highlight of my FF4 experience in any version. Unfortunately, this enjoyment came at a steep cost. It is not just the bosses who have been made ridiculously difficult but the random encounters as well, which makes simply traveling from one location to another at short at times. While I find the difficulty present in this version's combat refreshing, many will not be so forgiving of its obviously jittery balance. Ridiculous difficulty spikes abound in this title, making for pacing that feels less like a curve and more like a series of jagged cliffs that must be scaled. The addition of slow money accrual means that you will spend a lot of time grinding in this title. I wish I could say that this was the only problem I had with this version, but unfortunately it is not. Remember that incredibly long breakdown of the paladin quest I just gave you, I won't go step by step through it again for the 3D version, but I would like to use it to illustrate how just a few small changes butchered the original's perfection. I discussed how the devs were merciful and gave you an easy way to farm for money. Well, you could throw that out the window because money accrual has been dramatically reduced, making this part of the game a slog if you actually want paladin Cecil to be well equipped. The issues continue when you reach Mount Ordeal. The enemies in this version hit far harder than they do in the PSP version, which means that Cecil could not reasonably act as a healer or support character on his own especially considering how little money you get for battle to put towards consumable items. This means that the most obvious solution to conserve resources is to flee from these battles instead of fighting them, which means many players won't experience Cecil's transformation through gameplay as you normally would during this trek. The problems extend beyond that singular quest. For example, the game's brisk progression is gone. It took me about 20 hours to do a standard playthrough of the PSP version, while the 3D version took me 35 hours to complete what is essentially the same content. Some of this time discrepancy can be attributed to the PSP version faster auto battle system, but it certainly wasn't enough to shave off 15 hours of my game time. It also pains me to have to admit that every new feature added to this title hurts the game in a fundamental way. The 3D version of Final Fantasy IV makes use of an autofill map while on the overworld and exploring dungeons. As usual, the developer intent is clear here. It was meant to make up for the game's zoomed in camera to cut down on frustration, and the devs even tried to incentivize filling out the maps by offering items as a reward. Unfortunately, the system ends up backfiring in some key areas. The use of the map system takes all the mystery out of the dungeons because it blatantly shows the locations you've yet to explore. It even gives hints as to where secret passages are just by the player having moved close enough to them. This not only takes all the joy and discovery out of searching for treasure, but it shatters the immersion as well, because most players will find themselves staring at the translucent map, making sure they reveal every pixel as opposed to taking in the scenery. The rewards you receive for completing these maps are often insignificant, turning the task of filling out the maps into a compulsory habit that never really pays off. It reminds me of the same monotonous tasks used to pad out open world games, and it's completely unnecessary. Arguably the game's largest new addition in Strange's gimmick is the use of augments.
performance. It aims to fix the lack of customization complaint by allowing players to permanently grant party members bonus abilities that they normally would not have. This system is riddled with problems, however. First off, the system threatens to ruin the purpose of having characters with specific classes as it cuts down on their uniqueness. Secondly, this version's already precarious difficulty balancing is thrown even more off kilter by these abilities as they range from completely useless to overpowered. What's worse is that the devs can't properly plan for which of these abilities you will likely have access to because they are one-time use items. Players who are not familiar with Final Fantasy IV may accidentally waste important augments by giving them to characters who will become unplayable for the vast majority of the game, which is obviously an undesirable outcome, is it not? On the other hand, players who have experienced older versions of the game will likely remember what characters are going to leave your party and when, meaning if they are at all intelligent, they will avoid wasting permanent and one-time use growth items like augments until the end game when they have their final party. But you for being intelligent because the game is actually designed so that you can only get some of the better augments by sacrificing weaker ones permanently. There is no indication in game of what augments you will get or who they need to be sacrificed with to get them. That means that the only way to make proper use of the augment system on a first playthrough is to use a walkthrough. And because of the nature of Final Fantasy IV's story and how often characters are removed from your party, that means spoiling the game constantly for yourself. I cannot conceive of a single scenario where an intelligent game designer would decide that this is a good way to implement this system. I'd once again like to take this opportunity to stress that even good ideas can be ruined if the developers don't take into consideration how they will interact with each other, which was the case here. Neither the map system nor the augments were bad ideas on the surface, but they were forced into a game that was designed without them in mind, and proper steps were not taken to make them mesh with the game's design in a beneficial way. Now the rebuttal to this is that the augment system is meant to be taken advantage of in this version's new game plus mode, which brings us to the bonus content of Final Fantasy IV. The PSP version of the game contains two extra dungeons, the Cave of Trials and the Lunar Ruins. These dungeons provide a decent amount of fan service, as they allow for the use of any of the characters that you've teamed up with throughout the game, even those that have long since left your party. You then get to gather ultimate equipment to prepare them for one final super boss, which takes the form of Zeroma's EX, a modified version of the final boss from Final Fantasy IV Easy Type. While I hesitate to call this great content, it's a fun way for you to get a bit more time out of FF4 if you're a fan. Final Fantasy IV 3D throws out these bonus dungeons, and with them, the use of the extra characters in favor of exactly two extra bosses, each of which can only be accessed upon replaying the entire game from scratch not once, but twice. And I do mean from scratch. Your level is reset to one and you lose all of your items and equipment with the exception of your augments and very specific pieces of equipment that are so rare, many players likely won't even have acquired them in the first place. I love Final Fantasy IV, but I have much better things to do with my life than replay an inferior version of the game three times, the equivalent of about 105 hours hours of gameplay for only 20 minutes of unique content. Needless to say, I did not partake in this version's bonus content. I'd ramble on about how stupid this is, but it speaks for itself. Putting these two titles side by side makes the 3D version come off as an amateurish effort by comparison. I want to stress that the 3D version is still a great game, though it may not sound like it since I mostly focused on the aspects that make it lesser in comparison to the PSP version. Anything not mentioned here remains relatively comparable to the 2D release, so repeating it all again in great detail seemed redundant. The story is still entertaining, the world's still fun to explore, and the combat is some of the most well executed in the series. If the 3D version is all you can get your hands on, I still highly recommend it. And I'd likely still place it in my top 5 Final Fantasy games of all time, but a lot of the true brilliance was lost in translation, making a title that's arguably perfect into one that is merely great. It is a loss of quality, but that doesn't mean it is a poor quality, and that is a very important distinction to make. If you are unfortunately unable to play the PSP version, the 3D version is still worth a playthrough despite its rough edges. I would suggest playing the game with the newly created normal difficulty, which I remind you is not the default difficulty, unless of course you're a glutton for punishment as I am. There's simply no other way to put it. Final Fantasy IV on the PSP is a masterpiece. It falls as close to objective perfection as a game can get. It stands as one of the highest quality JRPGs I've ever played in terms of game design alone. And the story is also incredibly entertaining despite of, or perhaps in thanks in part two, its wackier moments depending on personal taste. If you measure a game's quality by how many flaws it has, then Final Fantasy IV is undoubtedly the best Final Fantasy game ever made, as the only things wrong with it are so minuscule that I had to purposefully and actively 
actively search for them. I even went crawling to other fans and even other reviewers, hoping they could give me some insight or point to something I missed. And when I asked them directly, how was Final Fantasy IV flawed? No one could come up with anything beyond what I've already detailed in this video. It's amazing that no one seems to have anything bad to say about this game, and yet it's very rarely listed as people's favorites. If you haven't played Final Fantasy IV and you were a fan of the series, you are missing out on a true classic.